Welcome back to our next session on track two. As mentioned, our panel discussion is this, this panel discussion is gonna focus on building purposeful communities to navigate through COVID-19. It comprises parents and school leadership, and they're gonna be in discussion with our moderator, Ms. Gauri Ishwaran. As we all know, Ms. Ishwaran is a favorite of many. She is the recipient of the coveted Padma Shri Award from the Government of India in 2004. As we know, she's an innovative educationist with over 30 years of experience in some of the leading schools of the country. With her vision, she has brought a paradigm shift in how education needs to be imparted to young children. She's been the founder principal of Sanskriti School, New Delhi. Currently, she is the Vice Chairman of the Global Education and Leadership Foundation. She is also on the advisory board of the Shiv Nadar Foundation. Her mission is to mentor and nurture young people to evolve into ethical leaders of tomorrow and be the change makers that the world so desperately needs. My heartiest welcome to you, Ms. Ishwaran. Once again, friends in the audience, please post your questions in the Q&A box in the Zoom panel. Over to you, Ms. Ishwaran. Thank you, Gitanjali. Thank you so much. Welcome to everyone. We are going through very difficult times because the pandemic has completely disrupted the education ecosystem and all of us stakeholders are struggling to make sense of the way forward. How do we make this radical transformation easy for our young learners to navigate? School leaders, teachers, parents, all need to collaborate and work as a team to meet this challenge because it is never going to be the same again. To discuss the issues, the changes, the problems, the strategies, we have a diverse panel. We have school leaders from the South and the East, and we have a parent from Delhi. I'm delighted to introduce to you all to Astrid Maben. She runs a school called I Can Learning Center in Mysuru, um, Karnataka. The school follows the Cambridge International uh, curriculum. Uh, something very interesting about her is that due to her abiding interest in education, she gave up a successful corporate career and has decided to make her journey in the school ecosystem. Apart from being an avid reader, she's a Bharatnatyam dancer and she's extremely interested in science. So with such varied interests, she's brimming with ideas and innovative thoughts. And I think we'll have a lovely dialogue with her going forward. Now from Karnataka, we go all the way East to Kolkata and we meet Seema Sapru, who is the head of the um, Heritage School in Kolkata. It's a school affiliated to the CBSC board. And Seema is completely invested in the well being of her staff, her students, and also her parents. She was recognized as a principal of the year India by India Today and EduComp. She's had three decades of experience in the school system and carries with her immense amount of innovative ideas. Uh, she has been brainstorming with all the stakeholders of what could be the way forward in the future during COVID, post COVID, and we look forward to hearing from her. Lastly, we have the most important stakeholder in many ways, the parent. Now, Rohini is a mother of three young children studying at the Shivnadar School in Noida. And therefore, she has a huge amount of stake in how the education system evolves. She's the head of the Legal International Division of Heavy Electricals. And she's a specialist in international arbitration and public international law. She was recognized as one of the leading women of the year by the World Economic Forum in 2019. She's very articulate and very involved in what she wants for her children now and in the future. 
So a warm welcome to all our panelists. And I hope all of you listening in will send in your questions and your comments because all these three ladies will be only too ready to answer your questions. Uh, we will start with Astrid. Um, Astrid, why don't you set the ball rolling? And I don't want to steal the thunder from you, so I leave it to you to present your ideas. Thank you so much, Gauri ma'am, for that introduction. I'm delighted to be here today. And kudos to the entire Ashoka team for conceptualizing this event and having us all on this common platform. To just put a little perspective, I thought I'll just tell you about where we are. We started our school 11 years ago as a small kindergarten, and our journey has been a fruitful one where our first batch of learners just graduated with successful results. Um, in anything that we did, we always took our learners along and our parents too. So to share this, I thought I'll just share with you our journey so far. Allow me to share my slide. So during this conference, I think the new vocabulary that's emerging is the new normal. And I thought we'll talk a little bit about how to build confidence and how to build communication in this new normal. In anything that we did, our school always took the stakeholders, which is our parents and teachers while moving ahead. Handling this situation was no different, whether it was the pandemic or how we started online classes, we started off by taking a survey from the parents as to what they had at home and how could we move forward. Having collected this information, we decided to go ahead with a few tools keeping safety in mind. I think you would have heard this terminology right through the asynchronous classes and asynchronous classes. They have a wonderful scope of self-study and teacher-driven modules. It provides for differentiated learning as well. And some of the tools I'm sure you would have heard in our previous panel discussion as well is Google Classrooms, Microsoft Meet, a fantastic range of tools to, for collaboration, which is Padlet or Kahoot, several, several um, you know, tools available to make learning online fun, to make learning online collaborative. Um, if you are a chemistry enthusiast or if you are a science person, there are several simulations also available to you know, uh, take you through this journey. But let's pause for a minute. And uh, if I were to ask you to create a piece of art, um, I think some of you would choose probably crayons and colors. Some of you would choose a canvas and create this piece of art, while somebody would probably do a charcoal sketch. And somebody else would pick up an iPad or a device and create this, um, you know, piece of art. I guarantee you that the at the end of it, you will treasure this piece of art no matter what your tool or device that you used. So this medium of instruction, this medium which is all new to us is one of the many tools that we have with us. There are several concerns that we have with regard to uh, online classes. And I'm sure this is something that is so common to each of the parents and it comes up every time we have a discussion. Screen time, how much screen time is required for my child? Availability of devices. Let me tell you, uh, in a city like ours, um, availability of devices is a huge challenge. Not every home has, has a you know, device with, which a child can use. Uh, being confined to an apartment, being confined to a home, lack of physical activities are something that a parent is concerned about. And in places where um, you know they have started the classes much earlier, in the south, of course, we have start not yet. We were on a summer break, but the north and other regions of the world had already started classes. We'll be beginning soon. But coping with assignments is something that is a big, big challenge for the parents. But if you think that uh, it's a challenge only for the parents, let me share with you a challenge which is for the teachers as well. The role of the combined team is keeping the parent, the teacher, and the child all together. I don't put them in separate boxes, but I keep them all together because as a team, we have social and emotional responsibilities. Our primary responsibility is being empathetic, being caring, being creating a, 
a medium where communication is from all three sides. So creating an environment of, which is conducive to learning is also something that we need to uh, keep in mind. While we go forward, uh, I would like to draw your attention to what the parent has uh, you know, to do because the amount that you need for collaboration is so high at this point. The cooperation that we need from the parent community is tremendous. Uh, a good opportunity to do PTMs. We've had several webinars, we've had several meetings online, and I think it really works well when we do our meetings online because in this um, you know, situation when uh, one doesn't have to go through traffic, one doesn't have to go through uh, scheduling conflicts, in a situation where you have a um, vast majority of single parents, you have, uh, you know, this, this works well for parents to come online and, you know, collaborate and have their meetings together. School as a community, this is what all of us are doing, are coming together. And I foresee that in the future, if we have common topics, common lessons, common plans, sharing all of these resources is, of course, vital. But not only for content, but if we design and share, uh, you know, our safety protocols, if we design and share our best practices, and if we think about the well-being of each and every one of us, which is our, uh, you know, the, the child, the teacher, and each and every one of the stakeholders, I'm sure it will be beneficial to all. But can we do it together? I think not, because definitely we need the involvement of the government because policies for evaluations, assessments, uh, the scope of the curriculum, many boards are looking at trimming the curriculum. We need to do that for the immediate examinations. And I would like to say if, you know, if we can consider the use of uh, devices as essential services, as much as you need the PPE gears, because our teachers are our frontline warriors. Our teachers need all of this to deliver the education that we need for, uh, you know, for the community at large. So this is my, uh, you know, requ requirement for everyone. And I'd leave you with this picture of the my city when we were at lockdown. We had empty roads. And at the same time, I could see uh, a beautiful gulmoha tree in blossom and the tabubia tree in full blossom as well. So it gives me to think that even though we were in lockdown, nature was there, life was happening around us. So never mind empty roads, never mind empty classrooms. The learning, the process of learning continues and the learning will never stop. Thank you so much for allowing me to share my thoughts with you. Over to you, Gaudi. Thank you so much, Astrid. You know, you did something very important. You actually held out hope that no matter what the uh, event, what, what the challenges are, there's always a silver lining and there's a way forward. And it's a question of our finding what is a strategy that will work and still deliver what we want. So the, one never gives up hope. And I think your last picture with the empty roads, but the beautiful flowers. Well, those are our children. They're going to flower like that. True. Thank you, Astrid. Very Thank nice. You. Thank you. And uh, Seema, now that we have heard Astrid and her point of view, I know that you have spent a lot of time talking to your teachers and parents, and that you've been thinking deeply about what's going to happen when the schools reopen. What do you think the scenario will be? So we look forward to hearing from you now. So off you go, Seema. Thank you, Gauri, ma'am. And thank you, uh, Astrid, for setting the tone. I would like to start with three things, actually, which have changed. Now, the first one, on a happy note, I think parents and teachers can take a breather um, as far as the good touch, bad touch is concerned, because, you know, COVID-19, we've been so protective about everything. We've been taking care of everything possible. No hugs, no going near anyone. So I think the good touch, bad touch can be taken care of. That's the first thing. Second thing, the schools had a social media policy and we were very careful about it. We said no uh, going to social media. And now we're encouraging that. So that's a little contradictory, but I think that's perfectly fine as of today. 
because uh, that's where learning is happening. And the third thing, which is very, very important is it is about our value system. If you remember, we've been telling our children from the very beginning, whether it's home or it is school, we've been telling children, share, share everything. And today we are telling them, don't share, don't share, because if you share, you will get, you will contract COVID-19. So don't share, please. So this is what we've been saying to our children, no food sharing, no stationary sharing, no high fives and no hugs. Upper things as it is, I feel, when the school reopens, whenever it does, our children will be wearing their school uniform and they'll be wearing so many other things along with that, that they won't be able to um, you know, recognize their own friends. So which is going to be so worrisome and so upsetting for all the children. Anyway, we'll begin with this. So school timings will change, of course. And uh, so that's that's everybody knows that because they'll become shorter hours. Only thing is, I feel extremely happy that we have the relationship, a kind of relationship, very wonderful relationship with our parents. That they give us a constructive feedback, very honest constructive feedback. And we've been sitting with them and we've uh, decided that we will develop a culture of listening. So we have been making a list of do's and don'ts. So that every morning in the server, school server, we will have a list of do's and don'ts. And in the classroom every day, the way an air hostess goes about saying what needs to be done every day, each time you fly. Similarly, the teachers will be telling the children what needs to be done that one day. So that's very important. Of course, the school infrastructural changes will be there. And the school wouldn't look the same. Teachers and students wouldn't look the same. Social distancing, sanitizers will become a part of their everyday living. And masks, face shields. I just want to tell you that this is something, it's, it's on a lighter note. I must share something with you. So there are people who came to me, some of the vendors, and they said, ma'am, we've made some customized uh, face shields and masks. Not that I'm happy with it. Not at all. So then um, could you please help me uh, move to the next slide? Okay, so we need to move to the next slide because I want you to see how the masks and face shields are being customized. Another thing is about assessments. And uh, see, what happens is we want fair, no unfair means to be used in the online examinations. So when we do that, could I please ask uh, Rubina, could you please change the slide for me? Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. So these are the slides where they have customized it for us. It's a little funny, but I think we will never ask our children to do this. This is, if you see the second uh, uh, picture, this is hand-free, hands-free. This is a foot-operated sanitizer. So that's what we are uh, installing in our school. This is a mask. These are gloves. You can see those. Of course, these are, you know, thermal guns and shoe covers and PPEs at times you may need them. Now, this is something about the assessment. So if you have a look at this, we will need all these things to happen with the help of our systems department. I'm technologically not that savvy, but I can assure you if you use this, you will be able to conduct uh, your examination without any worry. So that's something which is very, very important. Now let's go back to this. Transport again will, uh, I don't know if children will be able to travel by uh, public transport or by school transport. You may have to start going by your own uh, car or canteen. I think the schools will have to, uh, you know, maybe uh, shut their canteens for some time and children will have to carry their own food. So rules of living will change. And we have to understand that. The only thing now I want to talk to you about, which is slightly uh, you know, sensitive, but at the same time, it is very, very important. And I must tell you here that this is about a consent form that we've been thinking of, uh, but we aren't doing it alone. So this is parents and teachers, the school, family, all of us are getting together and we are considering asking parents and principal 
to sign a consent form. So you can have a look at this. Now, this consent form has been um, uh, drafted by one of our parents who's a doctor. In fact, I've written his name also here. So he's drafted it for us. And he says that, you know, there is a possibility that children go to school and a friend um, gets, you know, he's a, the child could be a, you know, in asymptomatic carrier. So he, the, the other child gets infected. And then there is a problem between the two parents. So that has to be avoided. Or parents could blame the school or the school could blame a parent. So this is something which has been devised and which has been uh, you know, drafted by the parent. So you can have a look at it and uh, maybe click a picture of this and use it. So uh, this is all what I wanted to say. And I hope that we reopen our schools uh, soon enough. And one important thing is that we're not just going to go through it and emerge uh, winners. I, I think we are going through it. We are actually going through it and we are emerging winners. It's not that it's in the future tense. We are in the present continuous tense. We are going through it and we are making a good, we making good choices in our lives. Thank you so much. I hope uh, I did mention certain things which would be of use to parents and teachers and students. Thank you so much, Gauri, ma'am. Thank you so much, Seema. Uh, when we talked about ideas on strategies and changes and problems, you really addressed that and you have put forward many ideas that could be controversial, but which should also be useful. And I thank you for painting the scenario of how the children will be dressed and how a morning assembly can be done. I think, thank you, Seema. That was very, very insightful. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. So now from the school leaders, we go to the next very important stakeholder, the parent. And we have Roini Rao who will be speaking to us. So Roini, you have just heard what Astrid has presented, what Seema has presented. And you have three young children who have a long way to go through the schools. So as a parent, what are your thoughts and what would be your reaction? Well, thank you so much. Now. For the handover and thank you for all the wisdom that you've been sharing because you know I represent today the community which is the most worried um, and, and it's something which is uh, very strange because this new normal for us has been doubly challenging for those of us who are ourselves going to try and get used to the new normal in our work lives to I've actually had trouble trying to do a work presentation without the children shouting at the background so it's a whole new situation for us. But nevertheless, um, having said so, let me start today um, by saying that perhaps everything that I want to say um, is summed up in the phrase that pain is always inevitable, but whether you choose to suffer, the suffering is probably optional. And let that be the tone of you know, what I'm going to discuss with yourselves today. Um, coming to the building of purposeful com communities, I think this new normal has really um, led us through several situations where we've not been able to come to terms with what's happening with the children. And the challenge for parents is completely different. We have mental health issues. We have physical health issues. Um, we have ratification and affirmation issues for our children. So, of course, I have a little slide presentation for you, which hopefully aids understanding because there's so much to discuss that, you know, my words wouldn't do justice to it. But I wouldn't like you to use the presentation as mutually exclusive. Um, so if you would like to read in detail, the slides are there for you. But I'm going to try and skip the details and be present as to what's really close to my heart as a parent. The first challenge that we are expecting in this new normal is the mental health of our children. There are societies in the West who have been developing uh, strategies to be able to quarantine together with their um, children and their friends, especially close friends. In India, we are slightly behind all of this um, because we are not still sure of exactly how to handle quarantining. 
we are not aware of social needs as much and emotional needs as much of the children, especially with tweens, teenagers, all across, even toddlers. So of course you do have well-being modules in school, but I'm not sure how much well-being uh, we're able to ensure because we need to now quarantine with our children's close friends. So that will be one of the major challenges that are we paying enough attention to the mental health? School and online schooling gives a wonderful sense of perfection to this whole system, because obviously we're getting the children to feel as if they're purposeful members of the society. So it's a very, very important side effect of the quarantine. And of course, being seeing their parents working online throughout, it gives them a sense of purpose and continuity, a sense of security that they're still grounded. So of course, the, the importance of online learning cannot be taken away. But then there are concerns. There are concerns with online resources. There are concerns with safety protocol. There are concerns with screen time. You know, how much uh, screen time is too much? Um, how much are we actually trying to, you know, activate screen time? Should we, should we be careful in terms of toddlers? Every group has a certain recommendation. So a lot is actually changing. There are online security issues which we're facing because it is impossible to actually sit through a lesson and monitor your child's understanding and absorption. So the, the biggest problem is that we are trying to undo what societies have done for so many billion years of evolution. So we are now trying to program absolutely contrary to what is our basic nature. So social distancing, which is, I understand it's part of the new normal and as Seema beautifully spoke about, you know, how the new changing environment of schools is actually going to have to have so many different things, uh, including PPEs, including the possibility of masks, including the possibility of so many uh, different things. It's going to be very, very difficult for us parents um, to actually imagine and cope with this new normal. Because the truth is, children were never made for social distancing. They were meant to be socially inclusive creatures. Humans were meant to be socially inclusive creatures. So what social distancing does is it runs the risk of putting these vulnerable communities to actually becoming socially distant. And there's a very big difference because the truth is no matter how much we try to equalize anyway, classrooms were never meant for equality, but at least with the same set of uniforms and the same set of infrastructure, tables, desks, we had some sort of a democracy an unsaid democracy in teaching. But today, when the same child logs on from an air-conditioned room setting with proper Wi-Fi, and then there is another child who's facing a very difficult situation with limited connectivity, electricity issues, an overcrowded street, and is trying to find himself a corner to log on for an online session, the equality does get destroyed. There are chances that that child is going to become very silent and meek in class. So social inclusion major challenge. And of course, being a parent, it, it affects you because at some point, at some level, your own children question that inequality because we come from schools which are teaching much beyond just you know regular course disciplines. So these questions do arise and how they deal with such questions will effectively determine the future. It's very important to affirm and ratify children's feelings at this time, to, to have conversations with them you know, around what is happening. Online resources, the other problem with online resources is that there's so much instant gratification of these resources that, you know, when your child is playing an online video game or even Kahoot or, or, or a quiz, there is an instant gratification. You see icons and bells ringing saying that, you know, you've done a wonderful job. So weaning these children back into the reality of being into a classroom where there may not be um, an instant gratification of that resource uh, is going to be one of the major challenges. It, because when they step out of this instant gratification system, they're going to realize that this is not immediate. And the same number of steps, which was about 20 steps to complete to target, uh, is now 200 steps. And that is the difference between virtualism and realism, which sort of takes their focus away. Similarly, with physical health, a big challenge is no matter what we do online, no matter how many modules we have online, to actually get them to be physically healthy creatures is going to be extremely difficult in, in this scenario. And you don't want to run the risk of having the online system replace uh, their physical activity. So 
I, the, there is another whole new level of challenge that a teacher faces in this whole scenario. And that's where I feel Astrid's point or Seema's point about how parents can be constructive collaborators instead of just playing the criticism roles that we've, we're used to playing sometimes. Um, and not in the negative sense, because a lot of constructive criticism has helped. But here again, we need to all connect first before we correct the children. And that will be um, the new mantra for sort of weaning them back. Responsible use of technology is something which is connected to this because as parents, we are terribly worried about screen time. We're terribly worried about, you know, how much is too much. But instead of worrying, we now need to educate ourselves and empower ourselves to understand how to, to modulate screen time, how to not discourage it because it's going to be there in their lives for a long time. So what we would rather do is teach them responsible use um, of, of screen time. One of the major challenges that I see around has been that I go onto these groups in social media. There is actually a group on Facebook saying, my child will not be the guinea pig. And you wouldn't believe it. There are 40,000 parents who've subscribed to this. It's, uh, I think it's, it represents Denmark's uh, population, which is very low in comparison to India. And yet there are 40,000 parents who are worried about this new normal and children going back into school. So while I completely take Seema's point on PPEs and you know, bringing in consent forms, which may be important from the legal arts perspective, but our main challenge is going to be whether at all schools are going to have these communities back into their classrooms. Because the way it looks at the moment, it's going to be the middle class and the upper middle class who signs out of school education, if it is not remotely done, at least until a vaccine is found. And they would be rather happy to do this as, as distance learning or home learning or even homeschooling. So the challenges are very many. The, the, today is a day of answers. Parents are going to have increased expectations from the school. They would want to know from the school that, you know, how are you coping? What, what are the measures that you're taking for sanitization of your workspaces, for dealing with this pandemic because one thing that coronavirus has proved is that the schools or the government nobody has what it takes to actually get through a pandemic without looking back uh, without faltering so one of these situations before we discuss consent forms is going to be that the schools will be made answerable that you know are you in a position to provide and look after safety because if you're not and if it's not a hundred percent mechanism I don't think the election of sending a child to school, it's, it's either health, safety or education. And there is no two ways about it that at least the middle and upper middle straighters will naturally want to choose this portion because they can afford to homeschool. Um, so these are, these are very many issues, you know, online, online contact with teachers. Again, a very major area. Now you do have schools um, such as our school, uh, Shivnanda does a wonderful job of you know, having a 360 degree feedback mechanism of connection to children, even sort of offline. And it's not so, so what we define as screen time is not just them performing activities online in terms of synchronous live sessions. Online is actually what meaningful resources are you employing with them, even when they're not on a video call with the teachers, how can they be monitored remotely by their teachers at the same time be safe, at the same time not have their parents, um, you know, not have the job of learning outsourced to the parents completely. So connections between teachers and parents, between teachers and their students uh, is going to be remote. Uh, it has to be remotely organized and it has to be much more frequent. Um, unfortunately, these are all how the new normal is going to look like. Um, these are some pictures which we had um, collated. If you see the bottom slide on Netherlands, now they've built um, ice cubicles, what they call ice cubicles, they're actually glass shelters between each cubicle. So you, if you could see the slide, you would have a fair idea of the amount of infrastructural investment that is going in to prevent this, you know, coming back to school and still it's not enough. It has not succeeded in assuaging the fear of parents. You know, but and the question arises that are we in India in a position to do that when we're still struggling and grappling with, you know, payment of fees, various other questions that the schools are confronted with. So, yes, parents role um, can actually play a wonderful role in the new normal. 
Just before I conclude my comments, I just wanted to quickly share this with you. The American Pediatric Association has a wonderful um, sort of description on what is screen time, because a lot of us um, seem to think that screen time is only about how much time my child is spending in front of the screen. But this is the point where I say that parents need to understand and educate themselves as well. It's part of the learning tree that the American Association of Pediatrics says that screen time is not what your child is spending in front of the screen. It's actually the amount of active time that the child is spending while doing games or while doing interactive software applications. And so therefore a video call or a Skype call doesn't even count medically towards screen time is, is what the data says. Now, regardless of the accuracy of that, the point is how much is too much? So let's, let's revise our um, estimation of calculating whether screen time is actually doing harm or not. We have to agree on limits with our children as parents and we have to walk the talk, which is what the last one says, that if we do not role model the same lessons that we build for our children and that we expect our children to follow, there are chances that they would never take us seriously. Last but not the least, what could we do as parents to actually have our constructive communication systems on? So I think it's all about, the slide does discuss what we can do in parenting, communicating, volunteering, but the most important, and I'll only mention one, which is the last one, maybe the last two, the last two speak of decision making. Now, I think this is this is a time when the schools have to learn how to involve parents in decision making, maximum um, involvement. And this is not going to happen. We have had PTMs, we've had you know coffee table mornings and so many other mechanisms. But to feel to make the parent a stakeholder, decision making has to be equalized, which is going to be a challenge because how much is too much is a question applicable to this as well. And finally, collaborating with the school community. I know that we as parents have always had issues, you know, but today is a time where even CBSC or IB or any of these courses would not straight fit the jacket because we are moving towards blended education, blended learning models. So this is a time when parents have to be able to know how best to positively, constructively contribute towards a learning mechanism that would be good for their children, for the school, and for everyone. So last but not the least, this is a time when a bend in the road is not the end of the road, unless we forget to make the turn at the right time. So I'm hoping this was useful. Thank you very much for having me on board. Thank you so much, Rohini. That was wonderful to get your perspective. And I love what you ended with that, you know, you may find the bend or maybe the, even the fork, but to take the right decision, to take the right fork is where it will make all the difference. So the parents and the school both have their responsibilities and hopefully the trajectory meets and the two can work out a solution. I don't know whether the word solution is the right, uh, right term to use at the moment, but at least we can carve a path forward, which will be enabling for our youngsters, because for them to navigate this is going to be very difficult from the instant gratification to going back to socially mixing with people. It is going to be a challenge. We will have a lot of issues on the mental health state of our children, our teachers, and it is something that we need to prepare for. And I'm glad that Seema and Astrid were able to address some of these issues. Thank you so much, Rohini, for your inputs. Thank you so much. Um, we have a lot of questions that have come in from the audience and um, we may not be able to take all and cover all of them, but we'll see how many we can um, put up to our panelists. One of the interesting questions that has come up which Astrid and Seema could possibly address. How do we encourage group discussions, peer learning through online learning? Seema, would you be able to answer this? Let me try. <clears throat> For you, it'll follow. How will this work with the younger kids? Uh, okay. 
uh, should I uh, answer, ma'am? Yes. Okay. So, Gauri, ma'am, what we've been doing with our children is, in fact, you would have seen um, a whole lot of people, you know, making, um, you know, um, uh, musical videos wherein one child plays the piano, the other child dances, and the third child is singing. So we have done these kind of videos with children. Now, today is Earth Day. So if I could share with you, had I known that this kind of a question will be asked, I would have actually brought those videos with me. They are so beautiful that there are these children who are, you know, these young little children of, you know, senior KG and um, kindergarten and grade one. So they are playing piano, one child, and the other one is dancing and the third one is singing. And they are, the video is being taken by the parents and it's being edited by our school teachers. So that's happening. Yes, yes ma'am. Seema, but um, when it, um, I think the, the quest, person who posed the question wants to know that apart from these activities, if yes. you have to have meaningful discussions on a uh, curriculum content, how will you yes. organize that uh, with, uh, through the online uh, mechanism? Ma'am, there are chats actually. If you're talking about little, very little kids, of course, no, that's I'm not talking possible. about the senior high school, high school kids. Ma'am, we are doing it uh, every day. In fact, what happens is we've got WhatsApp groups. Teachers, each subject teacher has her own subject group. Children, and they they continuously they are uh, you know exchanging notes and they are talking to each other. They are uh, you know uh, sharing their resources with each other. And ma'am, we have a very, I mean, it's a beautiful relationship we share with our children. So the teachers are asked as to what they would like. Teachers ask their children. And then uh, the librarian, who's not the librarian, who's actually a resource person. So she hands out books to the children. So e-books are given to children. There are, there's, there's this, uh, you know, sifting of all the information. Links are shared with children. And children then come back. And the best part is, that there are children who understand that the teachers are not being able to do certain things. They have the links with them, but they're not being able to do it. So teacher, children say, ma'am, wait, I'm going to help you. You press this button and click that button on the right hand side, and then you'll get to, you know, you'll get to that link. So that is how collaboration is happening. And I well, think children you. are loving it. Thank you. So <laughs> great. Astrid, could you let us know how you're engaging your little ones at the in such activities? So in school, what we decided to do for our very young learners, which is kindergarten up till grade um, five, at least, we've um, invested in this app called the Seesaw, which allows for asynchronous learning. However, having said that, we also plan a session once or twice a week with parent engagement and get them trained. So there have been questions for us that, you know, I'm working, uh, what do I do? So we've even agreed to train grandparents or caregivers at home so that they are part of this collaboration as well. And the assignments that are given out by the teachers are such that they, they form large group assignments and small group assignments. So they collaborate offline. So if they have a, a, you know, a task, which is a presentation to make, they do their discussion, they do their interviews, they do all of that and then present their learning together. And uh, there are opportunities where um, now the lockdown is slowly easing. So one or two learners have been able to go to say each other's house if they live in the same apartment and collaborate. So group activities, collaboration is something very much possible in this in this medium. And it's it is in a medium which engages the learner. So they are very excited to, you know, work on this medium. Thank you so much. Uh, another question that has come up is that do you see change in the priorities for school children in terms of skills and values post COVID? If so, what do you think the skills and values that will take precedence? Um, Rohini, from a parent's perspective, would you like to comment on this? Of course, but there is, there is just so many things to say to that. So I'm gonna try and restrict myself to the top value. I think the top value is to, you know, to, to cope and to duck when it's necessary and to move and the fact that learning never stops. I think Astrid had mentioned that in a presentation, the fact that life is a grind is what sharpens many a man's wits. And so the children have to be taught to be resilient 
um, you know, not just, I think, I think our age old values of classroom respect and uh, essential agreements are going to change. The first things first, we're going to have to teach them to tide through this adversity eloquently. Um, so in terms of values, in terms of culture, yes, I think also we need to stress on how to make them elect responsible behavior because on screen, online, um, there is never going to be a time when they're not going to be, when they're going to be monitored. And we have to go away from bulldozing and monitoring. So they have to be taught the effectiveness of electing their responsibility while online and being safe from the various online dangers. I think Seema had mentioned that one of the good things is good touch, bad touch is now away from the parents. But, you know, now there's a whole new form of good touch, bad touch, which is all <laughs> online. So I think definitely a great value shift for sure. Thank you, Rohini. And Astrid and Seema, now that Rohini has mentioned this thing about elected responsibility, uh, how do you think you can build that into your school curriculum and system to enable children to be responsible and to make responsible choices? Um, what I would say is, uh, and this is not something new. Uh, for us at school, children have always made, you know, given the option of making choices. They have always been given the possibility that if they don't like to do something, they can very clearly say no. So being responsible is actually one of the uh, skills and the values that are inculcated right from the very beginning. And uh, what I would like to say is, yes, these are challenging times, but children look up to, you know, especially the young ones, even the teenagers, they look up to their parents, they look up to the adults around them. So role modeling by all of us, by the adults, by the teachers, role modeling is something that we can, you know, because then they pick up our cues. And for some reason, if we are not able to, because, you know, we are human after all. And if any point of time, the anxiety or the stress gets to us, then having a chat with them to say, hey, listen, you know, I'm not feeling so good about it. I'm unsure about it. But can we have a conversation? Can we, you know, you know, tell me how you're feeling? Let me tell you how I'm feeling. And I think when they understand, when they are collaborating in this, they take ownership. They take leadership of their own decisions. Yeah, thank you. That, that's very heartening. Uh, Seema, do you also have anything, any further ideas to add how you would be able to inculcate in children this kind of an attitude? So ma'am, children, what they do is in our school in particular, there are a lot of student-led initiatives. So everything is done by children. So we as teachers, we take a back seat and we request children to do everything. So be it the student council, be it any of the fests, or in fact, there is one very important and very interesting part about our school curriculum, which is about a grievance cell. So we have whatever grievances children have. The teachers don't interfere in that at all. So the senior children take care of that. They, as prefects, they speak with children, be it, uh, you know, bullying, be it, uh, you know, a child who's from special needs because we have a, you know, ours is an uh, inclusive school. So if whatever happens, these children amongst themselves, they sort out the issues. And that is yeah. a wonderful yeah. thing. But Seema, is it going yeah. to be the same in your post-COVID school? Um, this is what you've been doing. Uh, will the scenario change? Will there be any change of skill sets when they come back now? Uh, Ma'am, uh, definitely there is going to be a little more of crisis management, which we are going to train them in. Because I think uh, this uh, particular, uh, you know, this uh, generation, they had never seen wars. They hadn't seen these kind of diseases. They hadn't seen anything much where they, they wouldn't do anything that was asked by the others to do. They would do whatever they thought was right. They wanted the best uh, mobile phone. They wanted the best um, uh, computer or laptop, the best of clothes. Um, so ma'am, this was required also, I feel at times. Everything, there was too much of everything. It was only Zomato, it was only KFC. They wouldn't eat at home. So these are things, this one COVID-19, I'm sure this has given them, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a shake up for them. And they must know that everything can't be done just the way they want it. So it is going to be a little more of responsibility. And in school, ma'am, we um, 
in any case we make sure that these children if required they clear up they they hygiene is maintained in the school they also mop the floors if required and i think and we do it with them i mean it's not that we ask the children to do it we all do it together so i think the responsibility will be more on them to be able to make sure that social distancing is maintained and you know they do not break any rules in school so Thank that you. which is to their, for their interest Thank you, Seema. Very enlightening. But the one question that it's from my side to both the school leaders: um, Your schools have children from fairly affluent backgrounds. Now, coming back after COVID nineteen, um, what are you going to do to sensitize them to the needs of all those children who don't have devices, who don't have proper homes, for whom schooling has been a challenge? so what are you going to do with your kids to sensitize them so that we can reach out and you know at least make an effort to reduce this inequity something that rohini had also pointed out ma'am we've already can i reply can yes. i answer ma'am so ma'am we've already done that in fact there are quite a few children from we have uh, thankfully we have ibdp and igcsc and isc and icsc so we have all these uh, different curricula in our school so children have made a large group they've already raised funds um, and they are going to various places uh, they're going to migrant workers as well so we've been involved in that so that's one thing ma'am we're doing second will you will you make this a part of the your whole school ecosystem or is this just going to be a few isolated activities ma'am this is actually happening for the last many years our school is in the 20th year and we we this this work continues to happen we have a creativity activity and service task program that we have in that ma'am we the children are involved with such uh, activities all through ma'am what apart from that, that let us hear from astrid now what her yes. thoughts are so um, what we did in school was we had this campaign called each one teach one and the responsibility of each of the the learning was uh, you know at a micro level so if you had a uh, you know in your home situation if you had somebody who was helping you if you had somebody who was taking care of your garden if you had somebody who was bringing in the, your milk how can you support at that level how can you share your knowledge how can you be a part of you know whatever you have acquired can you share it with them so it was more at the micro level where each family took responsibility to share their learning with with the the, the ecosystem around them so that was very effective because you know we were able to reach out to a wide variety of uh, you know uh, the, the community and if you lived in a area where you had a neighborhood which was accessible going out there and sharing a lesson plan in fact that's something that our teachers do also if we have a lesson plan which we can share with another school or another uh, you know uh, something in the community that is required that is something that we do so sharing and you know taking this forward in a very practical way is 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 happened and that is how i think even in the online uh, space when we create something when we share something it's very easy to take this and share that with you know the person who's part of your ecosystem thank you as in fact uh, my request to all the school leaders who may be listening in from uh, well to do schools i think the time has come when it is our responsibility as educationists to get the uh, blessed children who are better off to think of those who are denied even the basic amenities and how is it that we go out to help them empathy is something that is very often lacking and i think post covid this is one lesson we have learned and all schools should look at empathy as one of the fundamental teachings that we impart to our children now there's another interesting question here coming back to both of you how do you foster collaboration between schools to help support each other in the online world okay so i i can take that i think collaboration this what you're seeing today is a fantastic uh, example of collaboration and um, you know we are part of the cambridge school so all of the learnings that you have and you have teachers who are willingly taking online sessions you know training 
um, subject wise, a mathematics group having a session, a science group having a session, free sharing of resources. If you create a lesson plan, share it so that the other teachers can you know make use of it if you have an assessment for a topic that you have created share it so that you know it becomes that much less work for another teacher who has to reinvent the wheel so if we if we have a, you know i'm really thinking of a huge digital library where all these resources are stacked up where you have grade wise you have you know and because irrespective of the curriculum that you are teaching whether cbsc state board whether anything around the world the fundamentals of science do not change the grammar rules do not change so and and the way education is uh, you know um, the way it's planned is it's always age related it's not the curriculum so age wise if we have i'm i'm imagining this huge library where we all have access to and if through technology we can get together and have this huge digital library where we can just jump in and you know take things from there share it in fact one of the things that we have created is uh, say digital citizenship or uh, online safety protocol you know with hacks and how how can we aware so if we create a protocol like this how can i share it with the community at large so that they can in turn customize it to suit the needs of their school definitely i think this is far more doable in this digital platform mm -hmm. and we are happy to do that i'm sure each and every um, school will and the the school that takes on the mantle or the school that does this becomes the leader you know so that it helps everybody get along so it creates opportunity for that it, this is actually a, this is actually a wonderful idea and it, if it can be it could actually be even on a global platform True. as to I think once we are over with our panel and all, this is something that we have to follow up on. Definitely. <laughs> I felt that best practices are not shared enough, especially yes. in the country. We are so possessive. Every school is so possessive. Yes, Vikram. Yeah. But actually, we are all there to prepare the next generation. So there's nothing to be possessive about. And maybe COVID-19 will bring about this change in our mindset and culture. So Rohini, we have kept you quiet for so long. So would you like to say something? I'd just like to say that on, on that note, um, before I give a concluding remark on it, but I think this idea is wonderful. I, I, I think that we also need to see the government um, and the various um, administrative authorities in education need to see that this is a time when we have to make devices and technology available across all stratas of society. It yes. may sound utopian, but, you know, to be very honest, and uh, I'm going to share this with you at the risk of everything else, but in, uh, in Shivnada, for example, um, the, the school and the parents have come together. We're trying to find a, a resource mechanism. Maybe it could just be a parent-led venture where we can help each of the the neighborhood um, segment of children with dongle sets. You know, it's as simple as that. You could give them yes. a thumb drive and an internet connectivity pack. And even the, you know, the, the, the telephone collaborators like Vodafone and Airtel, everyone can come together in this initiative and actually make education affordable online. Uh, because in India, we're struggling with the basics like electricity, for example. Mm. So we have to respect where this is going. And then, of course, all I can say to end is that, you know, the devil was once an angel. I'm sure that this society <laughs> is not going to be as airtight. We will change. Uh, and one question that's popping up very often, uh, parents seem to be very concerned about how the assessment procedure will be followed in the online scenario. So what would you school leaders like to see there? Because a number of questions have come up saying that, how will you do it? Will it be ethical? If they are doing the uh, assignments at home, are they doing it on their own? How will you know? How will it be fair? The number of questions that are coming up related to that. Yeah, so I would like to say that the whole assessment module needs to be relooked at. Right now in the immediate, say for the next batch of learners, uh, there's very little that we can do in terms of if the board doesn't change its approach. But if we insist on, you know, assessments which are online, that is for the immediate. But if you look at the younger ones, is assessment really required? Um, you know them. You know them on a daily basis. How can you assess? Okay, you may get your math wrong. You may get your grammar wrong. But how do you assess if you're being helpful? How do you assess if you're being kind today? 
how do you assess? I would rather focus on skills and values today because the curriculum actually takes a backseat. As long as they're learning, as long as there's learning every day, it doesn't matter if it's from the book. It doesn't really matter. Except, of course, for the exam taking batch, which is over there. But for the younger ones, I would focus on skills and values. Can you fold your bed sheet today? Mama is having a tough day. Can you take out the trash? Can you, you know, these are the kind of skills if our learners can uh, be uh, empowered with, those are lessons for life. And there is no assessment for that. Anyway, thanks, Astrid and Seema. What would you like to say where this is concerned? So, ma'am, I think what uh, Astrid says, it's, it's absolutely fantastic because that's what I would like to do also for little kids. But, ma'am, if you allow me to share a slide, I would like to because I did share a slide with the, the audience at that point of time. And I'd mentioned it to everyone that this is something that's not my area. But, uh, well, this is... Uh, uh, this is you're showing us the consent form. Yes, no, ma'am. It's it's. I'm, I'm I'm not being able to move my slide because I okay. told. Okay. Why don't Why don't you just explain to us? So, ma'am, actually, these are um, ways of making sure that there are no unfair means used. Okay. So there are these, and and I'm not technologically very savvy. In fact, that's what I'd mentioned earlier also. Mm -hmm. So there were things. In fact, if you see that. People could click it and then maybe um, use it later because it's very, very useful. I took it from the systems department and I asked them because if you press a few buttons, then you will know that the child cannot use, uh, cannot copy paste. Okay. The screen becomes absolutely stationary. Then if you press a few other buttons, you cannot use any other uh, gadget along with your laptop. So there are certain things which you can use at the time of assessment. So these are senior school assessments, of course, they which have to be very, very serious. But what um, Astrid said for little children, I agree with her. They, I mean, we don't need this kind of an assessment for them. I think as far as they're empathetic, we're very happy. Thank you so much. If I could just quickly comment on, on that particular thing, because um, I also think that certain innovations around the assessment, uh, you know, as a tool would be helpful. So for example, if we are actually moving towards uh, structuring these assessments to be more formative in nature. For example, if they're related to their personal experiences. Now, everybody during lockdown and remote learning is in a different place. So you know that if they're related to their personal context, there'll be lesser chances of plagiarism. But of course, we would have to use technology like turn-ins and plagiarism. Anyway, software. thank you so much, uh, Rohini, because I think we're running out of time now. I'd like to thank the panelists for a very interesting discussion where I think you, I've also learned a lot and I'm sure our audience has. I'd like to thank our audience for listening in. Um, I feel that, you know, education, the basics of education don't really change. We have got so um, boxed in with our curriculum. We forget that education is about bringing up good human beings. And whether it is post COVID or during COVID, that is not going to change. So I think as school leaders, we need to keep that as a priority. The curriculum is there. Yes, unfortunately, the grades count, but that is not the most important thing. If from the portals of your school, young people leave, who will be the change makers of tomorrow? Who will stand up for their values? Who will have a purpose in life? Who will be able to communicate well? I think that is far more important. And I think in the post COVID era, that's going to count much more than whether you've got a 95% or whether you've got a 75%. It's the human being that we have to look at. It is empathy, it is sharing. Maybe this pandemic gives us that shake that yes. we go back to what in ancient times, that was our education. It was about sharing, it was about respect. It was about empathy, which we have lost along the way. Maybe it comes back now. So every cloud has a silver lining. And maybe this dreadful time that we are passing through will take us, take our children to better atmosphere, to better years, and make them better human beings. So thank you very much. And thank you, the audience. We had had wonderful questions coming in. Unfortunately, there was not no time to answer all of them. 
but i would request ashoka people to pass on these questions and maybe you all can answer them directly thank you very much and many thanks to ashoka university for having set up this and i'm very happy to say that two of the founders of the university have been my students so turned out to be good human beings thank you so much thank you thank you